there goes like Hello. Hello. happy friday happy friday Good weekend we made it um so i'm not gonna spend too much time doing another introduction because sam i feel like just did an amazing job of introducing both of you and how amazing both of you are the work you're doing how you're you've really stepped up to lead the next generation and to educate and um to call to to call us out and and challenge us and i'm just so so grateful to be able to have the chance to chat with both of you so thank you very thank much. You. um so i'm just gonna jump in and say first that it's a very unprecedented time um there's a lot going on um we're in the middle of a pandemic reminder to wear your mask everyone um there's an election coming up um, we are seeing an influx of, of protesting due to police brutality um, and just the general mistreatment of black people. Um, and it's a lot to take in. I know me personally, I've had my moments where I've just needed to like shut off the phone, step back, wusa, and come back. Um, but how has it been for you guys? Like how have you processed everything? Did you need a moment too? Or were you ready to just sort of jump in and and take part in what's happening. Um, well, for me, you're right, there's a lot going on right now. And um, at first, I don't necessarily wanna say I was um, overwhelmed. I think I was more rather unsure of what to do. Um, I felt stuck. It was like we were experiencing deaths after deaths. We were mourning someone at new every day. And so it, it kind of, I don't know, I, I want to almost use the word like suffocating and like you just didn't know what to do. Um, and so for the first couple of days, I was grieving and I was completely unsure of what my place was or what my role was in this fight. But um, after seeing the protest play out for a couple of days, I told my mom that I felt as though I had a duty to go out there and to um, use my platform and to use my voice for something that I was passionate about. Um, regardless of the whole COVID-19 situation. Um, and for me, there's this like Carter G. Woodson quote that stands out to me. And I think it's like so incredibly timely um, of right now. And it's, if you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his action. When you determine what a man shall think, you do not have to concern yourself about what he will do. Um, if you make a man feel as though he is inferior, you do not have to compel him to accept an inferior status where he will seek it for himself. Um, and so I was I was reading The Miseducation of the Negro um, while all this was going on. And so I just read that quote and it kind of reminded me of everything happening right now. And I felt as though if I stayed in the house, if I stayed put, if I didn't do anything, um, then I was kind of, I was a part of the problem. I was, you know, allowing these things to happen. And I was basically accepting this inferior status that, you know, I'm going to sit in my house and I'm not gonna go out there and use my platform and my voice to fight. Totally, how about you, Naomi? Um, so I agree with Lexi in the beginning and I think a lot of people kind of had this experience. It's, it, it was of course like heartbreaking, everything that was going on. And it was not something that I hadn't experienced before as this has been going on for as long as I've been alive and as long as any of us have been alive, but, just not knowing what to do and kind of being um, stuck in this place of being like really overwhelmed and viewing everything that's going on, but not knowing um, what you can do about it. Definitely, I felt super um, unmotivated because this, um, I feel like it's 2020 and a lot of people say that this problem should be gone and the brutality and racially charged violence shouldn't be a reality of today, but it is. And so, I mean, like a lot of the time I do my own research and I hear about um, people in the past who were working to change this so that we wouldn't be here in this situation now. Um, and of course they made progress, but we're still in this situation currently. And so definitely I was a little bit, um, like I said, I wasn't motivated to do as much as I should have because I, I felt as if nothing was going to happen, even if I did participate. But after a couple of days of really going through and sitting with myself um, and like educating myself on a lot of um, more what I could do, um, as opposed to just sitting back and watching other people do stuff. Um, I, I began protesting and I began um, talking and doing things like this. Awesome. Um, I know what's been happening with me a lot personally is I have a lot of um, my white friends either reaching out to me or reaching out to friends of friends and sort of saying, 
or asking, what do I do? Um, sort of not putting that responsibility on me, but sort of counting on me to to give them advice. So I'm wondering if, if you guys have been in the same situation at all and how you've been responding to that, if any. Um, I've definitely been in the same situation, um, but I'm all down for like educating people that aren't necessarily sure of everything happening um, because, you know, some people are unsure of what's happening involving this movement and why it's so port why it's so important because they haven't been giving the resources or the tools to properly educate themselves on these problems. Um, but then also, the same way that we are expected to learn about white culture and white history, the same way that we're expected to know about everything involving politics, everything happening within the white community, in my opinion, um, should be the same for the black community when it comes to our white counterparts. Um, like something that I was a part of a conversation with Logan Browning and something that you know she said really stood out to me and she was saying that our entire lives we've been expected, we always have white idols and white heroes. We always are just supposed to be so completely in, immersed in white culture. Um, but now I definitely believe that we're at the point now where everybody can also have black heroes and black idols. Totally. And everybody can be totally, completely immersed in black culture and understand what's happening. So while yes, I do wanna educate people and make sure that everybody has the resources and tools to be a part of this fight, it's also not our job to educate ourselves just the way, like the way that we're expected to educate ourselves on your culture and your history. Totally. You want to add anything to that, Naomi? Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that I'm sometimes in the middle of wanting to educate people and have conversations with them and help them learn more about what they can do or what all of this means necessarily. But I, on the other side, my mom has always told me this and I'm like kind of adopted the idea that that's not my job and that I don't have to be the person to educate um, somebody mm -hmm. who may not know about my experience or about other people's experiences because it's not necessarily my fault that they're not aware, but at the same time, as Lexi said, a lot of people don't have the resources or live in places where this isn't a really discussed topic. And so it's not as if they could have gone out of their way and had these conversations. So I really do appreciate it when a lot of people do reach out to me um, who aren't black and ask me questions, but at the same time, I just kind of want to stay away from that. Totally. Um, we have a viewer who wants to know who are your black heroes that you look up to, whether past, present, whatever. Um, I have, there's so many. Um, for me, it would probably have to be Diane Carroll, Cicely Tyson, Eartha Kitt, um, Angela Davis, Asada Shakur, um, Carrie Washington, Viola Davis. I mean, just all the black women that have blazed trails before me, my mom, my Nana, just all the black women in my family that I grew up um, just watching and admiring. And for the women that I named previously, I would not be here um, today without him. I without them, I would not have the platform that I have or I wouldn't be able to have, you know, the roles that I that I um, have the privilege to be able to portray um, without them. So definitely those women. How about you, Naomi? Um, Claudette Colvin, who was actually before Rosa Parks to not give up her seat on the bus, who we definitely don't learn about in mainstream education, who I didn't learn about until a couple years ago. Um, and Shirley Chisholm, definitely. Awesome. Um, and that actually is a great segue into our, to my next question for you guys is, obviously you're spending a lot of time using your platforms to educate other people, but what have been some of the biggest lessons or things that you've learned over the past couple of months with everything that's been going on. And uh, I think you can jump in. Yeah, I think, well, for me, um, without like disregarding, it, well, there, there are two things. Uh, one like on the political side and one on just like the more everyday life oh, yeah. side. And so for like my everyday life is, um, you know, something that not necessarily learned, but I think realized in the last um, couple of months is that everything is temporary. Um, moments, feelings, people, all of it is completely temporary. And we must learn to focus on the good energy um, and allow ourselves to soak up every moment that we share with each other because it won't last forever. Um, and don't take the people around you, the t don't take the people that love you for granted. Um, and even though, you know, something seems so big in that moment, 
it's so tiny compared to all the uh, beautiful moments that you'll have in this lifetime. So don't be so hard on yourself. And then also, um, while I have grown up in a household that has been, you know, just so heavy on making sure that I learn about my black history and black culture. Um, but there's just some stuff that like has been mind blowing of the fact that, you know, people didn't necessarily know about like Juneteenth before mm -hmm. everything happened. People didn't know about the Tulsa riots. Actually, I didn't even know about um, Black Wall Street and, and what happened. Mm -hmm. I recently learned about that in March, which is insane. Um, Naomi was saying Claudette, I had no clue who she was until I believe last month. And it's just like those type of things that, you know, we're always, like I said, kind of earlier, growing up, we're always taught um, kind of almost like these facades of we're conditioned what, to learn specific yeah, exactly about um, American history, but they don't necessarily tell us what this country was actually built on and who actually built this country and who paved the way for us to be here right now. Um, and so I definitely feel as though I have like social media, honestly, to thank for that, um, especially Twitter, because they've just been, so many people have been like coming out and making sure that they're using these social media platforms um, to educate not only just white people, but also black, black people as well that didn't learn about these type of things in our history classes. Totally, thank goodness for Twitter. <laughs> How about you, Naomi? Um, in January, I was invited um, to speak at the, uh, the, sorry, the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Um, and I was one of 12 youth leaders um, who were invited to kind of be there and participate in a lot of the conversations. And one particular part of that stood out to me. Um, when we were having dinner at some point, we were having a group discussion about motivation and like if we want to continue doing this with the rest of our lives or if we might not want to dedicate the rest of our lives to social issues such as this and a lot of the kids including myself had a sense of accepting the way things are and knowing that not in our lifetime the things that we wanted to accomplish were going to be accomplished and just racism is for me i mean some of it was climate change for me it was racism is a part of my life it might be a part of my kids life and their kids life and that was scary but one thing that i've learned definitely during these few months and in january when i had that conversation was to always ask questions and to never get super duper comfortable with um, everything that's going on if you don't want to accept it i think that my entire life i've kind of been desensitized to violence like this and racially charged violence because i was i was five when Trayvon martin was shot and killed and ever since i could remember um black men and black women were victims of violence Times and it's something that I don't want to see happen, but I feel like in the earlier parts of my life, I was so stuck on that's the way it is. So asking questions and asking why that's the way it is and how what else can we do to make um, the world a better place, that's definitely something I've learned. Totally, I agree. I think we've all gotten complacent to a certain degree and that's the beauty of this moment is that we're all sort of waking up and, and forcing ourselves to, you know, take some real action. And we have questions coming in, which is great. But before we get to those, um, I wanted to get to um, the next part of the conversation, which I'm excited about, um, which is, you know, I would love for each of you to highlight what you think um, deserves more attention in the social justice space in general, whether it's the erasure of black women or, or anything else. What do you think we need to be paying more attention to, especially, um, you know, guys and girls who are your age, who are in your generation coming up and sort of, you know, um, making their voices heard in a very real way right now? Definitely black women and the issues that we face, um, whether it's everyday um, living in our skin or it's um, walking out and knowing that something could happen to you because of the color of your skin and your gender. Um, I was watching the news this morning and I saw that they were discuss like, discussing the disappearance of Madeleine McCann, which is something that happened a while ago. And I also see that with John Benet Ramsey and other cases um, of little girls or girls in general who have been murdered, which was absolutely terrible. But we're not talking about the kids of color or the black kids who go missing or the black kids who, um, who have cold case files. I think it's really interesting seeing how um, this society has really held on to John Bonet's name um, mm -hmm. throughout decades. Um, but, but there are hundreds of missing indigenous children right now who are going missing from their foster homes and we're not hearing about them. Instead, we're watching a case that happened decades ago um, to a white girl whose life is obviously um, 
which obviously has more value, as she's talked about, than the indigenous kids or the black kids who go missing. And so I think that um, that's something that like has really stuck out to me. Um, the erasure of black women also, um, the erasure of anybody who's not um, a straight, cis, white male. Yeah. How about you, Lucy? It's honestly the same, just the erasure of black women and also black trans women um, and black trans men and um, black queer youth from the conversations of equality. Because a lot of times, you know, especially right now, I think with George, I think there was just so much happening at once and there was just so many deaths. But um, the sad case is I don't necessarily know if Breonna Taylor's... um, if there would have been as much outrage um, for Breonna Taylor if um, what happened to George Floyd or Maud Aubrey hadn't happened. I think it just all had to do with timing, um, which is incredibly heartbreaking. But even when we are pulling up and we're showing up to these protests, when we're donating, when we're signing petitions, you know, we handled Amanda Aubrey's case. We handled George Floyd's case. But it's been a hundred days. Um, Brianna Taylor's murders have still not been arrested. Um, only one cop has been fired, which is absolutely terrible. Um, and so I think that it is very important. While yes, everybody is coming together. This is you know this is great. Um, let's just please not forget Brianna Taylor. Let's not forget Toyn Sulua. Let's not forget Regis Paquette. Let's not forget um, Iana Dior, Dominique Fells. There were two trans women that were killed within 48 hours back to back. And there's no been, there's no news coverage of their deaths. There's, we have no clue what happened to them. We have no clue. And so it just, it goes to show, even like Naomi was saying, um, I don't necessarily, as a black woman, I think that there's so much that we have to go through on a day-to-day basis. Um, And on top of that, you just see, um, my mom and I were having a conversation today actually, where um, with black women, especially, there's so much outrage when it comes to black men and, and what happens to them. But when it comes to black women, they just treat us or they treat our deaths like it was nothing. When you hear just the heartbreaking stories of Breonna Taylor, um, her mother talking about, you know, how she was treated when she found out that her daughter had passed away. You know, they acted like it was nothing, like nothing had even mm-hmm. happened. And it's just so heartbreaking because black women have to go through so much on a day-to-day basis, whether that's constantly being over-sexualized, whether that's constantly being told how we need to dress, how we need to act, you can't be too loud, you can't be too quiet, or whether that's colorism. There's just so much that we have to go through. And even in the midst of tragedy, nobody is pulling up for us. Nobody is, you know, supporting us. Nobody is, you know, pulling up for us. And to me, that's so incredibly heartbreaking. So all these posts, the, this is all great, but let's just not forget about all the black trans women and men um, and also the black women that have been killed due to police brutality and um, gun violence. Oh, you guys are so impressive. I have nothing to add because you're saying it all. Thank you. <laughs> um, so um, I wanted to talk specifically about how each of you are using your platform uh, right now to, to bring, you know, these issues to light. Um, Lexi, you're an actor. Naomi, you're a writer and activist. So you know, you're both, you know, working towards the same cause, but I think you have, you know, both different gifts that you could use in different ways. So how are you going about doing that right now? Um, well, for me, I have my own production company. I started my my production company called Ultimate Dreamer Productions when I was 15 years old. And so I'm definitely using um, that outlet to create stories that are so timely and important to what's happening right now. Um, the whole point about um, my production company, since it's called Ultimate Dreamer Productions, Ultimate Dreamer is an audacious visionary. And so the whole point behind my production company is to finance and give voices to um, underrepresented stories and underrepresented um, storytellers that you don't see um, every day in the media. And so there's a project that I'm working on right now that I had the honor of allowing Naomi to be a part of, which is called We the Voices of Gen Z. And it's a um, round table discussion full of diverse Generation Z voices from all different backgrounds backgrounds, talking about social and political issues. Um, My first episode is going to be dropping soon, starring Naomi. Um, And we were talking about just Black Lives Matter and the climate of racism in America. And the whole point about that conversation is, you know, there's so much happening in the world right now. There's so many posts, so many people speaking out. um, But what do you do? 
Um, it's that, you know, overwhelming feeling like how we were talking about with the first question. It's that overwhelming feeling of like not necessarily knowing what to do. And so the project kind of gives that space and outlet, especially to Generation Z um, to not only, you know, find a call to action, but then also we talk about like the mental health and the trauma behind watching um, black and brown people get killed every day. Mm -hmm. um, just talk about how there's so much happening, but nobody really asks us how we're doing. Even with activists like Naomi, you know, we had so many incredible young activists a part of the conversation. Um, we're all just, we're all expected to, to show up and to have everything together. And a lot of people look to us um, to educate them and to, you know, look for next steps, but nobody really just look back and takes time to realize that we're all teenagers and while you know we're all in this fight together there's just so much happening there's so much trauma mm -hmm. about what we're doing totally how about you Naomi um so for me I'm on the um center at Georgetown University for poverty and inequality and one of the things that um I work to do there is in um, be very inclusive of specifically girls of color. There are seven of us on the board um, and we write blog posts and we enter art competitions and we do things um, really to push out our work and we have a lot of conversations about adverse discipline in schools and how black women um, are affected by that and the school to prison pipeline and really the center of school education and how that affects black women and black men um, and so that's that's what I do. I, I mentioned blog posts. I love writing. So um, I really I really want to be a journalist. And so while I might not have the ability to do that directly at the level that I want to right now, um, the board for Georgetown is definitely something that I like working on because I get to write um, and really push out a lot of the ideas that I have and that others have. I think you're doing it. I think you're a journalist already. You're not aspiring. You're making it happen. Um, so you should just drop the aspiring part. <laughs> Um, but um, I love that you mentioned self-care because that was another question I have. I feel like it's, you know, a part of activism work that we so often forget, whether it's, you know, as Lexi said, people from the outside looking in, not checking on us. And then sometimes we just forget to check on ourselves, not just in our activism work, but just in life in general, especially as black women, because we take on so much, we take care of others and we forget to pour back into ourselves. So how are you guys, you know, taking care of yourselves and and the people around you in the midst of the work you're doing? Um, well, for me, um, I use meditation and prayer as, you know, just a source to calm my spirit down and um, kind of just center myself and ground myself in the moments where there is so much chaos happening. Um, also, I take days off from social media I know, like, especially right now, everybody wants to, you know, be caught up and, you know, be in the loop of everything happening. Um, but I think my biggest thing would just be, you know, just because you take a couple of hours off of social media or day off of social media, you're not going to miss anything. We're all in this fight together. Like, we're going to we're going to keep, you know, pushing this movement forward. So take some days off because everything is so incredibly overwhelming. Um, and then also therapy. Um, something that I talk about a lot is um, normalizing mental health in the black community and also normalizing therapy um, because a lot of people I think are just not I don't necessarily know scared, but I just they just haven't really been um, really properly introduced to the world of therapy. But I think it's so important whether you're doing good or not. It's just so important to be able to have that safe space and that outlet to fully express how you're feeling because there are things that you can't tell your friends. And there are things that you can't tell your parents. And so to be able to, to just have that one person where you can just kind of be yourself and just say, hey, I'm not OK today or, hey, I'm doing great today. And this is right. why, you know, that's so incredibly important. Yeah. And to your same point, I think it's also important that, you know, we as a people, white, black, whoever, we're supporting the spaces that are making therapy accessible in the first place, because you know, mm -hmm. not everybody can pay for therapy. Finding a therapist is quite a process. I know because I have one and finding a black therapist is a whole other challenge. So <clears throat> therapy, awesome. And supporting those spaces that, you know, provide access to it as well. Yeah. Um, how about you, Naomi? For me, um, it was actually one of the things Lexi mentioned. Um, 
taking days off of social media because I know that I recently gained access to my social media about a year ago before that it was um, other people who were managing it for me. But um, now that I'm on it and just in the past year, I've come to learn that it's super overwhelming, um, especially with all the negativity in the air at the moment. Sometimes it's more positive, but sometimes it can just be too much and it weighs me down even when I'm not on the fo- on my phone. I'll go to eat dinner, but I keep remembering um, that I saw someone said this and I saw someone said that and that makes me really upset. And that makes me really um, like it. I focus on it so much and it becomes a big aspect of my life. And so one thing that I can do for myself to take care of myself um, and that I encourage for other people to do is to step away from it for a day or two, two days, three days, just as as long as you need so that you're not so over, like as you're not so immensely consumed in um, this idea of constantly taking in everything when you might not necessarily be able to handle that. Awesome. Great advice, which I'm going to take myself this weekend. Um, but we only have a couple of minutes left, and I want to make sure um, I get some of these viewer questions to you as well. Um, but sort of to, to start wrapping things up, we've talked a, a lot about how it's very overwhelming right now, and there's a lot to focus on. There's a lot that needs to be addressed, and I'm sure there is plenty of people out there, especially Gen Zers, um, who aren't really sure where to start or what to do um so what is your what's your advice for them like as far as figuring out like where they fit in this fight i think that wherever they feel best i know that that's not a direct answer to the question but one thing i struggled with when i was first getting into the activist community was watching other people's speeches a lot and watching other people um perform and do the stuff that they do and read so much about other people's work and try to replicate that. And the thing that really um, was really important for me was to take a step back and to think about what I wanted to do and how I felt that I could make the biggest impact that I'm capable of. And that included not um, looking to other people for my definition of success. That was looking for myself and looking into myself and looking in the mirror and thinking about what was best for me. So um, I, I used to be very focused on replicating what other people were doing, but stop do, to stop doing that um, and to stop looking to others for your definition of success is really the best advice I can give. Awesome. How about you, Lexi? Um, for me, I think I would say don't let anyone tell you that you're too young or too old to speak up about things that you're passionate about. Um, and please remember that you have a part to play. Well, we all have a part to play and that you're not alone in this fight. Um, there's this thing that my mom says and it's macro um, and micro. And so sometimes um, what we look at on like a macro level um, in terms of what's playing out on the national stage can feel so incredibly overwhelming. Um, And that's why even we, the voices of Gen Z, um, you know, the goal is to inspire my generation to have an impact within their own communities or within their own sphere of influence, whether that's within their schools, whether that's in their peer groups or even just their own households, um, getting involved with community politics on the local level is incredibly Uh, important. I think in that, Join your local groups. I'm in a community board and it's awesome. Um, So before we end, um, we have two uh, cool questions from the audience. One, they want to know how the two of you met. And um, two, um, they also want to know your thoughts on um, this past weekend um, with the Gen Zers who allegedly bought tickets to a certain president's (laughs) rally. What are your thoughts on that kind of activism Um, and uh, just your general thoughts on like how you feel about the work that Generation Z is doing right now? Um, Well, we met because I actually followed Naomi on Instagram. (laughs) And then I reached out to her to ask her to be a part of um, the first conversation for We the Voices of Gen Z. And I absolutely loved everything that she had to say a part of the conversation. And so we just stayed in touch. Awesome. And what do you think about the the TikTokers allegedly buying tickets? (laughs) Incredible. (laughs) Absolutely incredible. I 100% support it. it. I don't know. I feel as though it was a bit of a wake up call um, for president for yep, him um, <laughs> that, you know, we're not messing around. And, you know, yeah. even though I, I know that a lot of people like frown down upon social media or they think it's such a distraction, but that's like 
a perfect example of our generation mm -hmm. using social media for the good. And I think it has, um, there's this thing like impact versus influence. And I think that, you know, that even though um, to a lot of people, it may seem like that's like an influence type of thing that really made a major impact. And I'm so incredibly proud of my generation. And I think that, you know, I mean, we're the most diverse generation that there is, and we're going to be the the change makers and the one that ultimately saved the world. Um, yeah, it was really great to see. I actually reserved 10 seats separately. Um, and I didn't think that anybody yeah. else was going to be doing that. I wasn't sure. But then um, I tuned into the rally to see what it looked like. And there were so many empty seats. And I felt really proud of everything that we had done, even though it might not have been like a very political step, the, the impact that it had visually um, and like the the, it was like a visual representation of what social media can do in a positive manner. Because I think a lot of the times adults talk down onto social media, so it's really harmful. But I think it's a good, it was a good point to make um, when it comes to actually being able to utilize it for good. Awesome. I love that you bought tickets. That <laughs> um, But we have to wrap up. But I just want to say I'm just so impressed by you both. And um, we thank you for the work that you're doing. And, you know, I think I speak for a lot of us when I say, you know, we're committed to supporting you um, and helping out however we can and continue to just be amazing. And um, thank you for taking time out of your day to talk with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Thanks. Yeah, everyone stay safe. Put on a mask. Bye.